Now, the criminal justice system is something our next guest understands all too well as well. Reuben Miller is a former chaplain at the Cook County Jail in Chicago. He's also a sociologist, a criminologist, and a social worker. His new book, Halfway Home, exposes the realities of life after mass incarceration, and it shows that some people are never truly free even after leaving prison. Here he is talking to our Michelle Martin about the book and his own personal experiences with America's prison system. And a note that this is a conversation which is part of our ongoing initiative about poverty, jobs, and economic opportunity in America. It's called Chasing the Dream. Thanks, Christian. Professor Ruby Miller, thank you so much for speaking with us. I'm so glad to be here. Thanks for having me. You know, the whole topic of mass incarceration, the criminal justice system in general, is a very big topic right now, but you're focusing on the long tail of incarceration. What happens when you supposedly get out? How did you start to notice that this was a story in and of itself? I, I began this work as a volunteer chaplain at the Cook County Jail in Chicago. And so it was really getting close to these men. It was really looking uh, from the ground, not necessarily from the 30 or 40,000 feet in the air where we tend to look at these questions where we're counting things. You know, can you get a job or not? How many people are unable to get a job? What's the unemployment rate? No, no. What I found was that the, the, the fun, people's fundamental relationship to things like the labor market was different. Or, or are you able to reconnect with your family? That's very important. But what I found was when sitting across the kitchen table, those relationships and those conversations looked fundamentally different. Uh, for these folks than they did for other people. Why is that? Because we've created a pariah class in this country, because we've inaugurated an alternate form of citizenship for people with criminal records, because there are 45,000 laws, policies, and administrative sanctions that target people when they get out of jail or prison, that prevent them from getting work or housing, and these things cause real strain uh, in their relationships. I think what I hear you saying is people are still locked up even if they're not locked up. That's absolutely right. What I decided to study was what I call the afterlife of mass incarceration. And so this is the way that prison follows people. It's like a ghost. It shows up at their job. It shows up uh, in their relationship uh, between the, even their most inti their intimate partners. It shows up when they're trying to rent an apartment. It follows them. It traps them. People are imprisoned effectively in their home communities. Uh, but what's worse is the informal stuff. So there's the, there's the you can't get a job, you can't get a house because of the laws and policies that we've passed. But there's how that shows up in their everyday lives, in their everyday relationships with everyone else they encounter. And forgive me, Professor Miller, but I think this is where I think it would make sense to say this is also your problem. I mean, this is part of your life as well. Why don't you tell me a little bit about your story? Uh, you, in fact, you... You write about your story quite a lot in, in the book. Your father was incarcerated, has been, and so is your brother. How did that, tell me about that. Yeah, you know, so, so um, my grandmother uh, raised us and uh, we, were, we were in foster care, she, she, she took us in. And when my brother initially got in trouble, he was sent like many children who are in the foster care system to, to, to group homes. And from there, trouble escalated. So once marked by the criminal justice system, people begin to pay attention to you in a very different way. And for me, while I was arrested at 14, and you know, it's in the book, I was arrested because I was trying to do graffiti on a in a train yard. I'm, I'm not that good at graffiti, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, that arrest didn't follow me in quite the same way, in part because of the arbitrary nature of, of enforcement that we see happen in the criminal justice system. So what happens in, 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 in poor black communities, and I was, I was, raised in a poor black neighborhood in Chicago. Uh, what happens in poor black communities is on the one hand is over policing and on the other hand is under policing. There's over policing, but there's under policing and under protection. And so and so and so you 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 know that you can be arrested. You know that you might get in trouble. You don't know what that trouble looks like. And once you're convicted though, once once something happens that leads to a conviction, that conviction begins to follow you. And those many arrests that you may have had growing up, coming up as a child are then used against you. Uh, when you become an adult, and so and so and so, my brother, my brother's experiences uh, escalated from there. So when he became an adult and got into trouble, he had a record. That record was used against him. He was sent to prison. Um, and so and so, that's that's a part of that's that's a part of my story. The reason why I write about that is because it occurred to me that if I was being honest, 
that I would have been in my own social scientific model. I was born poor and black after 1972 when mass incarceration begins in earnest, and I grew up in a residentially segregated neighborhood. I, like every other black American man in this country and many black American women, wouldn't have been able to avoid the prison if I tried. Why do you say that? The prison follows you. Talk, talk more about that, because I think I think a lot of people have this idea that you you do so you do you have to do a you have to do something serious to get locked yes. up and yes. b you do your time and you if you keep your nose clean as it were and then that's done and what you're saying is that is just not true because you walk through that. Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example from the book. There's a man named Martin who was who was experienced serial traumatic episodes, all kinds of. Um, traumatic violations. He was the victim of sexual abuse. He was the victim of physical abuse and domestic abuse from his parents. He, you know, these things happen. The police were not there. There was no one there when he called for help, when he asked for help. No one there, no program there to meet Martin and help Martin figure out what was going on with him. Martin becomes homeless. Martin is arrested 14 times, not for some giant violent offense. He's arrested 14 times for trespassing all of which were misdemeanor offenses. Martin turns to drugs and alcohol. A friend of his dies. Too much trauma, too few people to turn to to help him process it. Well, he's arrested for uh, having three crack rocks in his pocket. He's charged with a felony conviction. Why? The judge says he thinks that's obsessive. The prosecutor says, well, his 14 arrests prove a pattern of criminality. And so, and so what happens on average, my guys were arrested 15 times on average. The, the guys that I followed, I followed 250 guys out of American jails and prisons in Chicago, Detroit, New York, and other smaller towns across the country. They were arrested 15 times on average, most of which beginning at the age of about 14 years old. Most of that for doing things that kids do every day. And so by the time they actually got in trouble, and when I say doing things kids do every day, I mean things like hanging out together, standing on a corner, uh, congregating in groups, you know, these kinds of things. And then when they finally get in actual trouble, those early police interventions are used to prove that they are indeed criminal. This is because Black people in this country are stripped of their innocence. They're viewed as already guilty, even as children. You're being very um, delicate about Martin's story. I found it deeply disturbing. And Martin was raped multiple times. Yes as a child yes. and as a young man and never seems to have gotten any care for what he experienced. And then yes. when he started self-medicating in part yes. to deal with the trauma, yes. he was punished for that. So I guess yes. what I'm asking you is, do you think that even as a child, you thought you looked around and think, thought, why? No, no, because it was so normal for so many of our friends to be arrested and incarcerated. No, because the, 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 the modal interaction, the everyday, the, the most frequent interaction that someone from my neighborhood had with the police was being arrested. It wasn't, it wasn't officer friendly or something like that. So much so that kids made games of it. Okay, here are the cops, let's run, <laughs> right? And so, and so, right, like, so, so it's like, 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 like and this, this, is, this too is the app, what, what I call the afterlife of mass incarceration, the presumption of innocence that's stripped from Black children, the presumption of guilt that, that, that's, that's dropped on Black kids all over the country. The fact that police only show up to arrest you, that they don't show up when you call, they don't show up when, when, when Martin needed someone to show up for him, for many Black children. And the literature says that. We believe Black children are four years older on average and more guilty when we see them. This is how, this is how uh, uh, Tamir Rice can be murdered within two seconds of a cop getting out the car. And the only question that we ask is whether or not the cop felt safe. <laughs> this, 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 this is how we get to that point. It's, it's the presumption of guilt uh, that, that's, that's foisted onto Black children, even Black children in this country. You also talk a lot about the long tail of financial burden that yes. attaches to being incarcerated. And that is something that has a ripple effect on any family member outside that may want to stay connected to you. Talk about that. That's absolutely right. When I was uh, doing my research in, in, in Detroit, this is during the time that my brother got arrested in the Michigan Department of Corrections, the average cost of a phone call for me to talk to him, because they only allow you to talk for 15 minute blocks, was $6.55. That was the average cost per phone call. That was after a series of reforms to reduce the cost. <laughs> so it's a $6.55 per call uh, 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 in an era of cell phones where phone calls are effectively free if you pay your, if you pay your, if you pay your average bill. 
families have been shown to go bankrupt covering things like the cost of phone calls. But well, let's are, talk about this for a second. You're saying the average cost of a phone call was six dollars and what fifty three cents. If the federal minimum wage is seven dollars an hour, come on, come on. If someone is paying is working a minimum wage job, making that federal minimum wage essentially <laughs> an hour's worth of their labor goes, goes into that into phone call. A loved one. Goes That's into absolutely loved right. That's absolutely right. And, and why does it cost that much? It doesn't cost seven dollars to make a phone call. So what's that about? Well, it, it, it's it's about it's about contracting with private services. When people talk about prison privatization, they often think about only private prisons. This is this is where the, this is where typically the, the the imagination of of what privatization looks like in prisons. But everything's privatized in prisons. So look at this look at this obligation for a hot second. The family pays for the phone call, something that's effectively free if you pay a monthly service for any other person in the United States under any other circumstance. The family pays for food because the prison doesn't cover the actual needs of the people inside. The family covers the cost of confinement in some states. They get a bill. This is what you need to pay because your, your loved one was incarcerated and we're going to charge you for that. The family covers the cost of legal fees, $1,600 for general legal fees. My brother was charged $600 for representation by a public defender that he met for 20 minutes on the day of his conviction, the only meeting with the public defender. Mm -hmm. All these costs are borne by the family for someone who the state has effectively made unable to care for themselves. That's on the inside, now on the outside. They're locked out of the labor market. They can't get a job. There's rules uh, that, that say they can't rent an apartment. It's, fun, it's legal to discriminate against people with criminal records and to deny them leases and to, to even evict them from, from homes if a grandmother, for example, lets a grandchild stay on the couch. Mm -hmm. So they can't find a place to stay. They can't support themselves. They can't uh, uh, get a job. Who's going to cover their bills when they get out? The family. And so, and, so, and, so, and, so, and, so, and so it's not just the millions of people who are incarcerated or even the 19.6 million people who are estimated to have a felony record. It's everybody who's connected to them. They're all brought into their punishment. This is what mass incarceration has done. Can you just read a little bit from the book that I think sort of captures it? I think you picked something for us. Yeah. This is from chapter four, a chapter called Millions of Details. And it's after I'm, I'm having a phone call with my brother and the passage goes, any boxer will tell you that it's the punch you don't see coming that puts you down, the collect call you didn't expect, the court date you didn't have the gas money to attend, the conversations you've dreaded having with your children about why their uncle was in prison and when exactly you expected him to come home. The honest answer, you're not sure. The $2.95 processing fee that brings your bills above your budget, the $292 that you've overdrawn your account, the six $34 overdraft fees because you didn't budget the last collect call, the overpriced boots, the unexpected embarrassment as you sit at your desk entering your loved one's order for 30 packages of ramen noodles. What it feels like when Michigan packages runs out of the flavor of ramen noodles he wanted. The fact that you know, or at least you think you know, that no one else is in your shoes. It's these little things, the daily disruptions that manage to pull you down. Shame does that too. Mm. Why shame? There's an interesting association between um, the arrest and the presumption that it's because of something that you did, <laughs> because of this, this, this neat connection that we've made in the American imagination between crime and punishment. So Americans look at the 2.3 million people who are, in a, who are in, a, in, a, in a U.S. jail or prison, and they look at the fact that 40 percent of them are black. And then we say to those, we, and, 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 and then say, it must be because of something that Black people do, despite the fact that there have been 2,800 exonerations since 1989, despite the fact that 95% of those cases are resolved in a plea deal. But these are things that we don't know because we don't pay attention to these folks. These are folks that we've labeled guilty from birth. And so because of that, because of this deep connection between what we presume to be behavior and punishment, you must have got coming uh, what you called for. One of the guys in my study said, I got what my hand called for. It's what he, what he said. In fact, people who would be in jail or prison when I would visit with them who were convicted of crimes they didn't commit said, well, I wasn't convicted for the crime that I did, but I certainly did something that made me deserve to be here. This, these, this is the kind of language that we circulate in. And so a sense of guilt and a sense of shame, embarrassment because of this terrible person that you must be follows you. And the second part, 
of the shame comes from the fact that incarceration separates families. It, 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 it pulls apart, it isolates, it makes it so that you feel alone. And when you're alone, there's very little you can do. You feel powerless. You feel as if you can't control the forces that are shaping your life. And for that, you feel a sense of shame. How does that follow you when you get out? Everything in the world tells men that men are to be the providers and protectors of their home. But there are 19,000 laws, policies, and administrative sanctions that tell them that there are hundreds of categories of employment for which they may not apply. And the jobs are unsustainable when they have them. So it's nearly impossible to get a job. The jobs you do get are often the worst kinds of jobs. And, 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 and then when the boss disrespects you at work because there's so few things that you can do, there's so few ways you can move, you can't leave the job and go, and go try to get a new one. And so what we've done is we've effectively pushed this group of folks out of the labor market and told them that their identity is defined by their ability to, to, to make money. Uh, th th this is part and parcel of how shame follows people with criminal records, but it does this in housing. It does this when it comes to civic participation, not just voting, but which offices you can hold. It does this when it tells you you can't sit on a jury. So every time you go before a quote jury of your peers, there's nobody on the, in that jury box that has had your experience. Nobody in the jury box that quite understands who you are and what you've experienced or even how you've changed your life after you've gotten out of prison. Nobody understands that. And you know that you know effectively that you're alone. What would make a difference? What would make a difference in your view? I talk about mass incarceration as a problem of citizenship. Mm -hmm. And I say that for a couple of reasons. Reason one is their unique laws, policies, and sanctions that target just them and their unique responsibilities just for people with criminal records and their rights are suspended in, 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 in many formal ways. That's, the, that's the, the kind of legal sense in which it's a kind of citizenship. But there's also a social sense in that citizenship at the end of the day is really about belonging. It's about belonging to a political community. It's about being a fully human participant within a community of other humans that has a place in the social world just because you're a human being and you're a part of our collective. I think this is the kind of thinking we have to take to this problem. And if we started there from this framework, this framework of belonging, from a framework of human thriving, what does the person who caused the crime need to thrive? What does the person who's had the crime uh, committed against them, the person who's been harmed, what do they need to thrive? If we start from this place of human thriving, uh, we'll, we'll start doing very different things. For example, there are 45,000 laws. We don't need 45,000 laws. In the state of Illinois, there are uh, uh, 50 housing regulations in the state of Illinois, one state, 50. We don't need 50. The second is to ask, when should punishment stop? When is one paid their debt to society? Is to have an actual reckoning with our system of punishment, to ask questions we haven't really asked. We've been operating on muscle memory for the last, I don't know, 50 or so years. And, and I, I think we can do something different. Professor Miller, thank you so much for talking with us today. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me.